Up until recently, I've been working in the Pentagon for three years, and according to my US colleagues, it's worse than a death sentence. Because it's the quintessential bureaucracy. Uh, it's more than 30,000 people. It's the, the biggest uh, bureaucratic building that you have ever seen uh, in your life. And I got to meet a lot of industry people from big and, and, and small, all alike, and startups as well, but they have been um, dealing with the very same problem. And this problem was adapt or, or die. And as you can see on the slide, 82%, the majority of the organizations, are doing some kind of a transformation now. 90% of workers are naming the top leadership, and they're waiting for a vision from these leaders to show them the way, how to get out of this quagmire. And 84% are reimagining the, uh, the organizational learning processes. These are huge, huge uh, problems that they are dealing with. If I wanted to, to put it on one slide, what the essence of the problem, then uh, I would go back to uh, Mr. Snowden, not that Snowden, it's a different one. He's a professor at Oxford University, and he has described different uh, contexts. It's simple, but what we have built bureaucracies for in the past 150 years is complicated. But let's just look at this slide. What's the problem with it? Big organizations, the mindset in big organizations seems to be very prevalent that they wait until you know, chaos happens. And they separate their best people, they send out you know, a team, and they are like firefighters. They will take care of the problem. And then they go back into complicated like nothing has happened. So one of the problems is that all the time, these seem to be the same people from the organization. So if you have to put out fires, but they are coming in more frequent, you know, more and more, these people are going to burn out. And they don't want to put out fires any longer. But the second one, which is even more important, is that there is no organizational learning on this one. So how can we create permanent VUCA? That's the question. And VUCA stands for, it's a military acronym. It was developed uh, in uh, 1987 at uh, a US war college. They wanted to describe the world as we see it when the Soviet Union comes crashing down. Uh, and it, it, it describes volatility, uncertainty, uh, complexity, and ambiguity. As in, they see there are too many players, they are interconnected, and the whole thing just is very hard to deal with. So what, what we can do in, in, in this kind of environment, I'm going to talk about four things uh, today. And one is the uh, traditional sort of way to look at warfare in my uh, sort of line of work, but you can translate it to all kinds of other areas as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about strategic foresight, speed and tempo, and also uh, strategic networks. So starting with the traditional mindset and giving you a little bit of a, uh, a history lesson. So how many of you have read Iliad? What's the main point of the book? What's the main question that, that Homer is trying to answer? So is it going to be the destruction of Troy, or is it the, the cunning way, which you can see later in Odysseus, and is symbolized by the Trojan horse. And we know what happens in Troy, but we also know what happens in history. So in history, the phalanx prevails. If you have seen 300, uh, to bring up another film, uh, you know what a phalanx is. And the lion must be hauled at all costs, and of course, you know, one soldier is protecting the other with the shield and using a spear or a sword uh, to destroy the enemy. But this becomes, the BA type of mindset becomes the major form of warfare uh, throughout history. And it, it lasts for several hundred years, and especially after Westphalia, this is the dominant type of warfare. But there is some kind of a change in, in uh, 1806 when uh, Napoleon uh, defeats the Prussians at Jena. And a new kind of, of, of mindset is, is born, which is called mission command. And if we want to understand mission command, we have to see what happens within this time period. So several hundred years, or even thousands of years, the same mindset. But suddenly it starts to, uh, to change. And this change you can see in uh, what is called Auftrags tactic. Uh, and the Germans, they, they experiment, they think about it a lot, and then they go into wars with the Danes and others, and they are experimenting with it, but in, in Blitzkrieg, you can really see the whole effect, you know, how effective this kind of mindset warfare is on the battlefield. And there are many theories why it is successful. Uh, some of these theories says that it's the orders that the, uh, the commanders are giving. Others are saying that, no, 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 this is, you know, the panzers, the, uh, the tanks that are being used at this time. Well, I would say that this is 
uh, education. From a very young age, they put even young commanders and soldiers into situations that are very ambiguous and very uncertain, and they have to make decisions in these situations. And this is Truppenführung. So the very essence of Truppenführung is, is yes, you have to demonstrate competence, but in situations which are not going according to plan. So they make sure that you know you encounter these situations almost on an everyday basis, and it's ingrained in you. And those people are sort of going through the ranks who are self-sufficient, they're making decisions by their own, and even changing the order. Well, for the military person like me, you know, changing an order, how is that possible? Well, there is one caveat. They have to understand the higher commander's intent. And understanding the intent that comes down from the higher commander, they can do decentralized execution. But those people actually are becoming generals who are thriving in these situations. They're seeking out ambiguous, uncertain situations. And this is the very essence of Truppenführung and Auftrag tactic. There is another problem with strategic foresight. An article in New York Times comes out uh, on the 9th of October 1903, and this article says that humankind will create a flying machine in the next 1-10 million years. <laughs> but you all know what happens on the 17th of December. So the Wright brothers uh, first flight uh, at Kitty Hawk in Virginia. You know, we're not very good at predicting future, let's put it that way. And this is what happens when, uh, in 2003, I go to Iraq. So the green one is uh, the British sector, the red one is controlled by the US uh, troops, but the brown one is the multinational division. Uh, and I'm out there, it's roughly the size of Hungary, uh, and I'm working in the intelligence division, and all the intelligence reports are coming to me, and I have to make sense out of it. And I realize, you know, that what we have been trained for as soldiers, the traditional warfare, does not apply any longer. We are still expecting some kind of the same rule book. You know, the phalanx, you know, on one side, us, on the other side of the field, maybe the other army, and we're just going to fight it out. But you know what happens. So the soldiers uh, from Saddam, they wear civilian clothes, they hide amongst the uh, civilian population, and they fight a guerrilla type of warfare. Well, warfare is not easy, and war is not that kind of thing that you can see in Hollywood movies. It's ugly. But it gets even uglier if it's ambiguous and unpredictable. If you don't know who the enemy is, if you don't know how they strike, or if they're using all kinds of methods that are not chivalrous in, according to our values. Well, if you have to keep those values and standards at the same time, then it even gets tougher. This has happened to us in, in Iraq. The biggest uh, casualty rate was, was created by what was called improvised explosive devices. These are homemade uh, devices that have killed a lot of troops. So we tried, and by we mean the military uh, overall, to create some kind of protection for our troops, to, to protect them from these devices. But it took a lot of time. So uh, billions of dollars later, the US Army has created a solution, but it took 31 months. Well, what we could see on the other side, that you know, the enemy that we thought is fighting a lesser kind of war has been hacking these devices within two or three months. And we have to come up with new and new protection and stuff like that. So actually, somehow their decision-making processes are operating much faster because they are fighting what we call an asymmetric war. We, have, we still stick to the BA kind of mindset. And we had to realize that we have to create what uh, Sun Tzu calls Xi situations. If you take the Asian book, you look in there, you can read the essence of it, but if you imagine, for example, going back to Asian Greece again, Sisyphus, rolling up that big rock on the hill, just imagine that once you do that, you try to position that rock in a way that it can go down in a multiple of ways, and you decide you know, which way it's going to roll down. So those are the kind of she situations that the master strategist Sun Tzu tells us 2,500 years ago. And this is what we have to create somehow. And I believe that the third component, strategic networks, uh, helps you to understand how. So to give you some good news, there was another kind of, of mindset on the battlefield at that time. It was a unit that was called JSOC, Joint Special Operations uh, Command. And it, uh, it was 
non-existent officially, but since I have seen the intelligence report, I've seen a lot of their, their, their reports at that time. And if, if you think of Navy SEAL 6 or Delta Force, so those troops who are not acknowledged uh, officially, they're all part of this group, and they have been fighting the uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So Abu Musawa Zarqawi and his terror organization was, was pretty tough uh, to, to defeat, even for these soldiers who were the best trained and equipped uh, on the world. But the leader of this organization realized the problem, and he has created a hybrid type of organization, and he started to integrate the BA and Metis type of, of, of mindsets into one uh, sort of organization. And the result was incredible. Within a few years, from 2003 until 2006, he has created 17 times productivity in the organization. So if you are coming from business and I'm telling you that there will be a 1,700% increase in productivity, probably you're going to listen to me for about 20 minutes, right? So this is what he did. This is what you have seen, because the organization works quite secretly, but this is what you, you have seen. I mean, JSOC was the one who pulled out Saddam from, from the ground. They were the ones who, uh, who have defeated Abu Musawa Zarqawi, and JSOC was also the one uh, that killed Osama bin Laden later on in Abu Tabad. But the organization, in a relatively short amount of time, changed quite a lot. And the way he did it, he, he didn't get much more money, he didn't get even more people, but he changed the organizational structure, the decision-making processes, and he really put the, what I have just explained, the mission command philosophy into next gear. And he used modern technology at that time to enable his soldiers to defeat Al-Qaeda in a more decentralized manner. So first of all, he created a huge sort of secure room that all classification levels could be discussed in there. So uh, everyone could, could talk about even the most, most classified things. You can call it a big open office uh, in a way. But there were some, some separate rooms in the back. You could, you could still have some private conversations if you really wanted to do. But the effect that he has achieved is called Team of Teams. And this general uh, was called uh, McChrystal. And he said that you have to push decentralization, if you're a leader, to a level when you're really feeling uncomfortable. So he put the, uh, the special forces operators, the drone pilots, the intel specialists, everyone who was supporting the organization in the same room. And what it created is that they started to respect uh, each other and start uh, to, to, to learn and trust in each other uh, in a much better way. So beforehand, within a month, it was only, let's say, uh, 20, 25 raids, because the decision-making cycle was too slow to, uh, to go around. But by lining different cultures, and this was the main point, he was able to bring different cultures together and align them for the same goal. And he had VTCs, video teleconferences, and there were about 5,000 people on these video teleconferences at one time. Every single day. And he wasn't talking, by the way. Sometimes he injected his intent uh, as the commander, but it was the troops from the ground who had the chance to come up like, I went out, I did this last night, and this is what I learned from this. And if you are interested in the details, there is this chat room, and we can go in there and we can discuss. Next one. And for an hour or an hour and a half, he was synchronizing uh, what he was doing, and then he let his troops do what they do best. Because they knew the intent, and he just had needed to, to trust them. So he increased speed, and he achieved a balance, what we in the military call tempo. So the new Top Gun film is coming out, and now it all comes together why I'm wearing my Top Gun shirt today. Uh, I'm pretty excited to see Tom Cruise, what, 30 years later? But actually, there is, uh, there is one guy, and his name is John Boyd. He was a colonel, an Air Force pilot, who was really good in, in aerial combat. And he came up with a system that he calls OODA loop. And this is not as simple. It took him almost 30 years from all kinds of sciences. He put this, this thing together and he put, actually raised it to, 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 the, to the strategic level. But it's a cyclical way to make decisions. And the main point in here that if you run this OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act, faster than your enemy, you become proactive. And he 
has to actually counter your, your actions. And you can test it out in your own lives, in many, many areas. And then, then you will be able to, to feel the power of it. But you have to remember two things. One is that decision, Boyd has written hypothesis in there. It's not written in the stone. So he said that you have to have a probabilistic thinking. And don't wait until all information is, is, is in. We soldiers, we, we have to make decisions, sometimes on the spot, with insufficient information. So you just have to do with it. And then immediately you have to go into action. Because action is actually testing. So if you go and, and, and you learn about you know, the lean movement and all these things, this all goes back to this kind of philosophy. You know, reiteration faster than the enemy. Well, what does it mean at, 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 at the organizational level? And if you're working, how many of you are working in, in an organization that has more than 200 people? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. You know, you observe something, something down at the trenches, you are the food soldier, let's assume, and then you push this up, you know, to the decision maker, it takes ages, and then it, by the time it comes back, the decision, you know, it has nothing to do with what originally the problem was. And this was the same uh, in Iraq for McChrystal and his people and, and many bureaucratic organizations. And this is what McChrystal's solution was. So he had a synchronization period. For him, it was every day. For other organizations, it might be weekly, bi-weekly. You have to experiment in your organization. But once you have synchronized, you have to let you know, the tactical level deal with it. And this is tempo. So you just have to balance the awareness that is brought from the synchronization period when the commander's in intent is communicated and understood by, by everyone, and execution, which is you know, down at the, uh, the tactical level. So the four things that, that I was trying to communicate so far were the planning-based sort of mindset is, is over. If you read the, uh, the Harvard Business Review in 1998, Mintzberg writes about the death of, of the planning-based methodologies. He doesn't give you how to go into the future, but he says, you know, planning in and of, of itself does not survive in today's VUCA environment. So you need alternative strategic options. You also need to create the she situations that I have talked about. And that's why you need foresight to proactively shape the future. You also need to create the balance between awareness and execution, and you need to align the cultures. So how does leadership look like in a VUCA world? How does Mission Command 2.0 really look like? If I said three things, uh, competence, self-sufficiency, and extreme ownership were the solid basic rocks or the three pillars of Mission Command 1.0, in today's digital world, it's changing. It's changing because no one leader is able to oversee all the processes. Even for military leaders, you know, they could communicate their intent and were able to, to make decisions. Today, it's just simply impossible. So the intent needs to be an emerging intent of several people. Even you inside the organization need to chip in and create that shared awareness and, and, and the intent. And once you have it, decentralized execution, us in the military, we definitely feel it with drone swarms and everything, is going to be decentralized human machine execution. And for that, I think you need learning ability, creativity, and a shared type of ownership. One more thing. And I've learned it from Astro Teller. Uh, so Astro, if you don't know, he is the, the grandson of Edward Teller. You might have heard about him. And he right now, I mean, Astro works for, uh, for an organization that probably you have heard about as well. It's called Google. And he's leading the, uh, the X uh, division of Google, which is doing all the experiments. So he's a pretty smart guy. And the problem uh, that he described is that why in the 1900s, for us humans, it took about 15 years to adapt to a new technology. Just think of the rail, you know, and you didn't have to send a horse, you know, between the, uh, the, uh, on, on, on the railroad. It took 25 years for that technology to spread. Well, today, this time period, because of the exponential nature of digital technology, is shrinking. It's, it's somewhere between five to seven years. Well, we humans have improved as well, but it still takes us about 10 years to adapt to a new technology. So uh, what I'm throwing it out to, to scare you, that if we humans are not able to totally reimagine the individual 
and organizational learning processes, then we are already behind the curve. But that distance is just going to increase. And you're going to feel more insecure, uh, and you're going to see that the world is, is becoming even more unpredictable. But I have a lot of faith in humans. And uh, to actually testify that, uh, I have a story for you, which has happened on the August 17th at Chopu. I'm not sure if anyone has been to Chopu uh, before. It's a beautiful island on, on Tahiti. Uh, and the, uh, at that time, on that very same day, a surf legend was born. His name was, uh, and is still, uh, Laird Hamilton. And a rogue wave was forming uh, on, on that day, which has created probably the, the biggest wave of the decade. Uh, beforehand, surfers were able to surf maybe 10 feet uh, sort of waves. Uh, that was predicted to be a 100-foot wave. So everyone's telling uh, Laird not to do it. The second problem was, if you have ever you know, surfed before, you know, with big, big wave surfing, you know, if you, you, you try to, to, to go into the tube, you know, the worst thing can happen, you know, that the, the, the wave you know, crashes over you, you have to hold your breath for about two minutes, you come up, someone picks you up, and you have a pretty good chance to survive. Well, it's not the case with Chopu, because it's a, it's a coral reef. So if that wave, you make one mistake, and it crushes you, then you're going to roll over the coral reef, and you're going to die. So uh, that day, Laird does not listen to anyone, and he goes into the wave. And just imagine, it's, it's probably twice the size of the tunnel over the chain bridge over there. And it's like you are jumping out with your surfboard and going vertically down the edge of the, the, uh, the surface of this huge amount of water that has so much power with, with enormous speed. And it's just impossible. We all know it's impossible because it's 10 times as much as it has been done by humans before. And he just does that. But the way he does that is that he has a totally different mindset. His fear actually disappears. His physical capacity and ability to make decisions not just doubles, but it's three or four times in that when, while, while he is having that, that kind of mindset. And he has such focus that time slows down and clarity that he is able to pull this amazing feat off. And the surf legend is born on that day, but it's much more than that. So I have faith in humanity because we know how to hack ourselves. We know how to actually have 10 times productivity ourselves. We just need to be able to train for our mindset instead of our skill sets. So we have the wrong approach. And I'm not saying, because I completed this fine institutions, to quit right now and go out and search for ecstasy. So we, with psychology, technology, and neurobiology, we can hack human beings, and we can hack the way we learn. And if we don't do this, we're not going to be able to speed up to machine speed in the future. I think that's the main message that I wanted to communicate uh, here today. Thank you very much for your attention. What we're seeing today is that governments and intelligence agencies are constantly undermining personal freedoms, such as privacy, in the name of national security and protecting the nation at large, right? Um, but then again, if, if the security of these individuals are weakened by these increasing mass surveillance programs, then aren't they at a greater threat well, thank you very much for the question, which was also a statement, and you have sort of answered your own question. But <laughs> if, if, no. if you read a, 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 a book, it's called the, uh, the Pentagon's Mind. And there is a, the last chapter talks about the atomic donkey. And this brings up this paradox that you're talking about. So I definitely suggest you to read that chapter. But every technology that we have invented so far, and AI, which is actually enabling surveillance devices right now, and, and algorithms which are supporting these devices, uh, is, is doing the same. So every technology can be used for good or not. And this debate is ongoing. And, and the, on the ethics side, and this is what I would like to highlight, from us, from NATO, from the alliance, there is always a human in the loop. It will be always a human, in, according to, to our concept, who will make the decision whether if you know, harm will be done to people. So surveillance is one thing, but you know, action is a totally different matter. Thank you so much.
my question would regard the decentralization aspect. Like you said that by decentralizing the decision making process, we can speed up the, um, the whole procedure of bureaucracy. But I think that because of people, um, people's need, like the human nature, we don't like to make decisions. And I think that can cause a flow in the process. In my opinion, there are three types of people. And you have to, to distinguish between them when you're decentralizing. So one type is, uh, is, is hesitating. So if you are giving your intent, which is the left and right boundaries, this is the type that you're talking about. You know, they don't use the decision-making space that they are being given. So I think they needed to be coached. The other one is, we believe, is harmful because you're giving the two you know, boundaries and if, if, if the person is actually going out of bounds, that's what most you know, uh, managers and, and, and leaders fear of. But I think that the best type of people who is actually using the decision-making space that you're giving them, and it's trainable. We do that uh, in the military. That's why we have so much training. You know, we go to war, luckily, uh, not very often. But when we go there, you know, we would like to see leaders who are actually using that decision-making space. But for that, we need to proactively put people into situations where you know, they need to, to, to learn you know, uh, making decisions on their own. Thank you. I've got a question uh, regarding how you deal with the enemy. How do you learn from the enemy, right? And how do you figure out what's the next step there? So what is the strategy there? Yeah. Well, there are two angles to go at it, mm -hmm. and, and, and one is, is humility. I come from a, a special forces background, mm -hmm. and you know, special forces are always different because special forces originally was created to think like guerrillas, because they, they can train guerrilla forces and they can train the local forces to fight guerrillas as well. So uh, those people who go through that training, it's, it's not about physical fitness, mm -hmm. it's, it's a mental transformation, and they, they, they really, really have to learn a lot of humility along the way. And, and what we do uh, at the organization level is, is what we call AARs, Often Action Review. So after each mission, before you know, we, we, we put the gear down, we come together, you know, ranks down, and everyone tells their point of view, okay, this is how the mission went. And we learn from each other, and, and this is really no bars hold conversations, and, and really just everything is on the table. But you have to put your ego, leave your ego uh, uh, in the door for those conversations. Thank you. Hello, my question is, uh, could you name a great book about the topics you were talking about? Yeah, actually, Matt Crystal has a book. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's called Team of Teams, uh, it, exactly the same, same things that I, I was talking about. Uh, and it's been published in Hungarian as well. Hello. So you finished your talk talking about hacking the human experience. And other people are studying this and calling them flow states. What I want to ask is, do you have any experience in um, applying this into more mundane situations, or more like day-to-day -day life? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you two examples. And uh, actually, it was a Hungarian you know, psychologist who came up with flow. It was uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, Mihai, who is out in, in, in Florida now. But I'm gonna, giving you a military example. They have used flow uh, to train snipers. And, and their learning ability went up by 243%. Uh, Navy SEALs, uh, the SEAL Team 6, who captured Osama bin Laden, they have what they call a mind gym. They cannot go and learn a language in, in one year. It's too long time. So they've built this sort of, let's call it mind gym for themselves, and they get to the same learning or speaking level in six weeks. And the, the last example is, is uh, McKinsey had a study uh, recently about flow, which was examining CEOs. And these CEOs had five times the productivity. So they could come in Monday, and they would still do as much work uh, if they were in flow all the time uh, as, as their counterparts during the whole week. Hi. I see that the human-machine co-evolution is actually a thing that is going to happen, but we have two threats. One is uh, a possible uh, alienation of the human, and on the other hand, social diversity. People that are going to be richer are going to be more uh, machine enhanced. So that could be a big problem. In our company, Sapiens, we are looking for the very same problem. You know, it's the human side of, of digital transformation. But I'm dealing with innovation on an everyday basis. And I believe that, that you know, transformation and change management 
it boils down, it's a human problem. It's 90%, you know, it fails because of, of human resentment and, and everything. And innovation is not actually coming up with the next new shiny thing. You are innovative if you're able to push the new technology down to the warfighter level for us military or to the operator in other companies much faster than others, than your competition. Hi, um, I was just wondering, as someone who spent so much time in Iraq, do you have any viable solutions for the Iraqi-Kurdish conflict in the region? Sorry, that's really not my cup of tea. Okay. Do you have any um, thoughts on that? or? Um... Yeah, we, uh, we, we have to get much better at nation building. Uh, I come from a military background. And I could talk about you know, fighting the war and, and, and learning the, what we call the hybrid type of warfare. And we have become, in the last 10 years, we have become more professional fighting those kinds of wars uh, within the people, by, with, through the people, and enabling the people to actually create their own security. But there are several steps that come after that that does not belong to the, to the military. What do you think, what would be the best uh, for the companies to implement this strategy? So what can be the first step? One precondition is that the top leader really needs to believe in it. Uh, I was just three weeks ago, I went to IBM in, in Austin, Texas, and I, I talked to the guy who, who has initiated the whole organizational transformation process. It was done in five years, and it was remarkable, but it all started with top leadership actually supporting it. If you don't have top leadership buying it, I'm not just talking about it, but actually modeling the change and behaving according to those rules and really paying attention and, and spending time with, with, with learning how it, it, it needs to be done, don't even start this. All right, thank you. Wonderful. Imre, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was really compelling. A big round of applause for Imre Porkolab.